Take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. I think they're going to keep the lights down for a second because we want to show just another video in a second. But Exodus chapter 25. So let me ask, uh, how many of you remember playing hide and go seek when you were a kid? How many of you still like playing hide and go seek? I've always sat back and thought that this building would be a fantastic place to play hide and go seek. As a matter of fact, I thought we might have an adult activity one day that's just a hide and go seek night and we turn all the lights out, send you out to hide and the pastors try to find you. I'm not sure whether, whether we could do that or not. When I was growing up, my mom had this game that we played at our house. She called it the ghost of midnight. And so as kids, we thought it was like the greatest thing in the world. And so all it was, was we would turn out the lights in our house and go hide. It was just hide and go seek in the dark. But to us, it was like this unbelievable novelty, the ghost of midnight. And so we would go hide and then she would try to find us. And then, and then it would be my turn and I would be it and they would go hide. My little sister was an expert at this. My little sister was younger than us, and she could hide in, like, the best places. And we would, like, search all throughout the house, and we'd find my brother, we'd find my mom, we'd find my dad, we found the dog, we found everybody, but we couldn't find my sister. And, and, and she would, you know, crawl down in these little cubby holes in these little places, and she would hide so well that we couldn't find her, that there'd be times we'd have to yell out in the house, okay, Debbie, we give up, we can't find you, where are you? And I think there were a few times she'd fallen asleep, and then we really couldn't find her. And, uh, but then she would come out, and she would reveal herself. She had hidden herself so well uh, that we just couldn't find her. So let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever felt that way about God? Have you ever felt like God was playing this celestial game of hide and seek from you? You couldn't find him. You wanted to find him. You were searching for him. You couldn't find him, and you, uh, as it were, yelled out, Okay, God, I give up. Where are you? I think all of us have gone through times in our life where we wondered where God was. We wondered whether God was present or whether God was just hiding himself from us. But let me assure you of the fact this morning that God was not, God is not hiding from you. As a matter of fact, you might be here today and you desperately need God and you seriously wonder, where is God? Well, let me share with you today that God passionately wants you to find him. God passionately wants you to talk to him. God passionately wants you and me to trust in him and follow him. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah, I just finished reading the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said this, or the Lord said this through Jeremiah in chapter 29 and verse 13. He said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your hearts. And God desires for us to seek him with all of our heart. So the question this morning is not, is God hiding from you or is God hiding from me? But the question is this, are you truly seeking him? Today I want to do something just a little different. Rather than reading the passage traditionally, we have a, a video that is going to read the passage and not just read the passage of scripture, but visualize what we're reading because we're dealing with just a little bit of a difficult passage with the Ark of the Covenant. And so uh, you follow along and you watch as Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22 are read. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. 
You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end, and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And so um, in that passage, Moses is given instructions how the ark of the covenant should be made. As I read that and, and kind of meditated on uh, those verses the last few days, I know they're, they're detailed verses, maybe just a little bit tedious verses. That's, kind of wanted, that's why I wanted you to see a picture of what is being described in that passage. But as I, as I read it, as I've seen drawings of it, as I've seen representations of the Ark of the Covenant all week long, I was amazed at how beautiful that, that divine box, that ark, would have been. But it's important for us to realize that the significance of the Ark of the Covenant was not in its beauty nor in its value. As a matter of fact, we look at something like that and we say, if the Ark of the Covenant could be found today, how much would it be worth? I mean, if we could, if we could find it and, and, and take possession of it and sell it, why, it would be priceless. Why, the, the value of this box and the significance of this box or this ark. But here's what I want you to catch today, that the worth of the ark of the covenant is not in what it, um, or or was not its value, it was not the gold that possessed it, but the work of the ark of the or the worth of the ark of the covenant was in what it represented. Because the ark of the covenant represented the fact that God was with his people. And so as we look at this passage of scripture today, and I know at times when you read the latter part of the book of Leviticus and you read the book of, uh, uh, or, or the latter part of the book of Exodus and you read the book of Leviticus, at times it becomes tedious and at times we sit back and think, oh my word, what is God trying to say to us in that passage? But here is what God is saying to us and obviously the Israelites in Exodus chapter 25. It very simply is this, that he is with us. And I want you to catch this this morning. Just as God was with the Israelites in the Old Testament, so God is with us this morning. And with confidence, you and I can assert today, God is with us. As a matter of fact, would you repeat that with me today? Say that with me. God is with us. That's what I want us to catch today. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Father, thank you for the promise as we will see that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that just as you were with the Israelites in the Old Testament, you were with us today. Maybe not in the same way, maybe not representing yourself in the same form, but you were just as much with us today. You are just as much in our midst, in the center of our church, as you were in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the camp of Israel. So God, I pray that you'd help us to grasp a hold of that truth and not only understand it from, a, from an intellectual point of view, but God, I pray you'd help us to understand what that means and how that plays out in our lives today 
in 2017. And so speak to us from your word this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's, here's what I want you to catch. If you have your outlines in front of you, the first thing that I want you to see is this. God desires to dwell among his people. God has always desired to dwell among his people. As I've said, and you'll hear me say repeatedly throughout the message, just as God was with the nation of Israel, so God is with Hollywood Community Church. Just as God was with the family of Moses and the Levites, so God today is with your family. And there is nothing that you and I are going through in our lives in which God is absent, in which God is not there, in which God is not actively involved, and a God in whom you and I can trust, and a God in whom you and I can lean on. If you're following along in in your notes, I, I, I made this statement. I said, the story of Scripture begins and it ends with the presence of God. Now follow along, although although God is a transcendent God, we use the word transcendent to mean that that, that God is beyond us, he's not like us, he doesn't live in our realm, he he doesn't live in our time, he doesn't have a watch and, uh, and, and realize that it's 1035, he is beyond us. But though God is beyond us, he is not distant, God is not detached, God is not disinterested in his people. To the contrary, think about this, God is a people person. Do you ever see people who are people people and other people who aren't people people? Uh, I mean, the people people are the ones who are gregarious. They're the ones that are out. They're communicating. They're talking. The other people are a little bit quiet and, and they're distant and they don't make relationships very well. Catch this. God is a people person. God isn't just sitting in his study reading the Old Testament. God desires to have a relationship with you and me. God desires to communicate and to have fellowship with us. We see that all throughout Scripture. Think with me all the way back in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. When we first see man, God has placed man in a beautiful garden that he himself inhabited. The first few chapters of Genesis picture God walking through the garden. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 3 and and verse 8, we'll see that verse in just a few moments. It says, basically says this, that God walked through the garden. So we see this picture of God walking through the garden of Eden, interacting with Adam and Eve. And so God and the very first couple communed, they communicated and they cohabited together. Let me just pause, I want you to catch that. That is the way God designed it to be. God did not design us. He did not design his world so that he would be distant from it, so that he would not be involved in your life or in mine. From the very beginning, we see God having a relationship with man. His presence was there. By the way, the Bible ends the exact same way. In in Genesis chapter 3, we find God walking in the garden, communicating with man. In Revelation chapter 21, guess what we find God doing? With man. Notice this verse in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is where? Is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. You might sit back and and ask the question that I've asked this week. Wait a second, Brian. If God designed us to live with him, if God designed us to live together, and if God plans on us spending eternity together, then what happened? How come we don't sense, how come we don't feel God's presence with us on a regular basis? Well, notice the second thing that I put in your notes, and it's so very poignant, it's practical. Sin hinders us from experiencing the presence of God. Sin hinders us from experiencing the presence of God. 
As a matter of fact, you'll find in Genesis chapter 3, we always act, and I used it in the illustration, as if, as if God is hiding from us. But in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, we don't find God hiding from Adam and Eve. Rather, we see the contrary. Adam and Eve are hiding from God. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And so who was the first one to hide? It wasn't God. It was, an, it was Adam and Eve who were hiding themselves from the presence of God. Now, you know the story. They were hiding themselves from the presence of God because they were ashamed of their sin. And I want you to see the result of that sin because the result of that sin was that God drove them from the garden. God drove them from his presence. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24 says, And he, God, drove out man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Listen, I want you to catch this. This is from the very beginning. We see the story played out all throughout Scripture, and the story played out in your life and mine. God desires for his presence to be real. God desires for his presence to be palpable in our lives. But sin enters into our lives. And it is sin that separates us from God. It's not God that draws back from us. Rather, it is us who draw back from God. David realized this after his great sin with Bathsheba. You're familiar with the story. King David, who was a man after God's own heart, looked and lusted after a woman and then committed adultery with Bathsheba. And as a result of that, he felt the separation from God. The man who had written the majority of the Psalms and who talks about being close and being in the presence of God makes this statement in Psalm 51, verses 10 and 11. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with me. Notice what he says. God, cast me not away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. What was it that caused that separation in David's life? It was sin. Here, a man after God's own heart who sat out underneath the stars watching the sheep, penning some of the greatest psalms, spreading some of the greatest spiritual poems that have ever existed, communing with God, and all of a sudden, lust comes in his life. Sin comes in his life, and sin separates him, as it were, from the very presence of God. And he cries out to God, God, don't run away from me. God, don't leave me. God, I desire to feel and to sense your presence. I love how the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. Isaiah said this, but your iniquities, the word iniquities is just a big word for sins. But your iniquities, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. Notice this. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sometimes we sit back and say, man, I'm, I'm crying out to God, but it's as if God does not hear me. Have you ever thought that in your life? And we fail to realize that those sins in our life, as it were, block, keep God from hearing the cry of our heart, hearing the desires of our hearts. Man, man catch this church, sadly, we are often so discouraged, so distracted, so discomforted by sin that we fail to experience the presence of God in our lives. Maybe that's you this week. Maybe that's me this week. 
We've allowed the pressures, the the sins of life to kind of cloud our our vision and kind of uh, cover our eyesight. And it's not that God is not there. It's that because of our sin, because of the fact that we are distracted and discomforted, we cannot sense his presence in our lives. God, though, didn't pack up his suitcase and go home. God continued in the Old Testament, and God continues today to dwell, to commune with, to have fellowship with his rebellious children. Now you might sit back and say, Brian, I thought we were going to get to Exodus chapter 25. We are. And that's where Exodus chapter 25 comes in. Because here we find God's people rebelling from him. And from the Garden of Eden all the way up to the book of Exodus, we find God's people repeatedly, time after time, rebelling, turning their backs on God. And here's God attempting over and over again to dwell with his people. So in Exodus, here's what God does. God tells Moses to construct an Ark of the Covenant, a representative, a visual representation of the presence of God in their midst. Now, dive in with me just a little bit. Let's notice a little, a few specifics of the passage. Because the first thing is we see as we read through, and we won't read through these verses again, you've heard them read, but we see that the Ark of the Covenant was to be built with precision. As a matter of fact, God gives specific, specific specifications, as it were, as to how the Ark of the Covenant should be formed. It says in verse 10, it says, two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half shall be its width, and a cubit and a half shall be its its breadth. Now, if you're like me, you sit back and say, I have no idea what a cubit is, right? Anybody, as you're measuring your house, your, your wife wants you to measure for curtains, and you grab the tape measure, and you pull it out, and she says, how long is it? And you say, three cubits. None of us do that, all right? Cubit isn't a, a, a measurement that we use in our culture, but just so you know, a cubit, during Old Testament times, it's debated, but most believe that a cubit was 18 inches. And so if a cubit was 18 inches, the ark was approximately four feet long, two feet wide and two feet deep. And as you heard read and as you saw visualized in the video, the ark was overlaid with pure gold inside and out. It had a beautiful gold rim around it and it had had these beautiful images of cherubim, which are angels that were sitting on the top. The top of the ark was called the mercy seat and they were placed on top of the ark and the two cherubim were viewing each other and that top was called the mercy seat. And God instructed Moses to construct the, the ark of the covenant to exact specifications. Let me pause there and and just say this. Details are important to God. Sometimes we overlook the detailed passages of Scripture. If you like me, you get to the book of Numbers and you read, you know, John begat Joe and Joe begat Bob and Bob begat Phil and Phil begat Tom. And you're sitting back saying, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump to the end of Numbers. We all do that. Why? Because those details at times aren't important for, uh, to us. But as we read Scripture, we need to realize that details are important to God. So, so if you're here today and you think that God is oblivious or if God is uninterested in the specific details of your life and mine, then you are mistaken. God is a God of detail. And we see that in the specifications of the ark. I want you to see a second thing as we look at the passage. The ark was to be placed in a specific location. The ark was to be placed in a specific location. Numbers chapter 2, and we won't take the time to go there, details for us that the ark was placed in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was placed in the tabernacle. 
and the tabernacle was located in the center or in the middle of the camp of Israel. In other words, I think we have a, a picture if we put that up or we could put that up because uh, the Israeli dwellings, the tents, were placed all around uh, the tabernacle. A fourth of the tribes were to the east. A fourth of the tribes were to the north. A fourth of the tribes were to the south. And a fourth of the tribes were to uh, the west. God was located in the very midst of his people. And we'll see what that means in just a moment. But, but, but here's the third thing that I want you to see. Not only does the ark have precision, not only was it supposed to be put in a specific location, but the ark was given a purpose. The, the ark had a divine purpose and its purpose was not beauty, although it was a work of art and although God is a God of art, its value was not necessarily in its beauty, its value was not in its artwork, its value was in its significance. And I want to mention three purposes that are given for the Ark of the Covenant. And we'll take just a few minutes to flesh it out today. And next Sunday, Pastor Jose is going to speak and he'll flesh it out just a little bit more. But notice three purposes of, of the Ark. The first is the Ark was to remind the Israelites of God's pardon. The Ark of the Covenant was constructed to remind the Israelites of God's pardon. I shared with you that on top of the ark was the mercy seat. And as you saw it visualized, it's not really a seat. I kind of struggle with that just a little bit because I'm trying to find a seat, you know, a padded chair on top of the ark. And there's no, there's no padded chair. There's no throne there. It's called the mercy seat. So here's what took place. One day out of the year, the high priest entered into the holy of holies. And on that one day, he sacrificed an animal without spot, without blemish, and spread the blood over the top of the Ark of the Covenant, spread the blood over the top of the mercy seat. By the way, that was done on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And if you know anything about the Jewish calendar, yesterday was Yom Kippur. So once a year the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. No one else was allowed to enter with him. And I don't want to give away uh, Jose's information next week, but he entered in with a rope tied around his ankle because if he died inside there, no one else could go in. They had to have a way to be able to pull him out of the Holy of Holies. And so the Ark of the Covenant for the children of Israel, it was a reminder. It was a constant reminder of the fact that God desired to pardon his people for their sins. If you're interested, you can read about it in Leviticus chapter 16 and Hebrews chapter 9. As I mentioned, Pastor Jose will flesh that out next Sunday as we speak on the Holy of Holies. It was to remind the Israelites of God's pardon. It was to do a second thing. It was to remind the Israelites of God's power. The Ark of the Covenant was to remind the Israelites of God's power. As a matter of fact, inside of this box, inside of this covenant, there were three things that were placed, three specific items that they were told to place inside the Ark of the Covenant. The writer of Hebrews fleshes it out in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4. Notice what that verse says. It says, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was the golden urn of manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So, so inside the Ark of the Covenant were, were three things. There was a bowl, a golden urn with manna. Now, 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 if you remember the Old Testament story, we've already studied it there in Exodus. It says the children of Israel traveled from Egypt to the promised land. They went through a period in which they didn't have food. And they cried out to God saying, God, we have nothing to eat. And what did God do for them? In a miraculous way, every single day they walked outside their tent and there was this bread-like, golden, sweet, crispy, kind of crispy cream donuts type of substance that was outside. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? What do you say we all go to Krispy Kreme after service, huh? The, the, this, this sweet coriander-like substance that they gathered, it was called manna. 
And every single day they visually saw the power of God in their midst. And so God says, so that Israel doesn't forget what I've done, put a bowl of manna inside the Ark of the Covenant. There was a second thing inside the ark. It was Aaron's rod that budded. And you can read the story. At one point, there was a a power struggle. Some, uh, some, Some men stood up and said, wait, who is Aaron that he should offer all of the sacrifices? We're just as qualified as Aaron. And God says, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you the man that I've selected. And so he asked them to take their rods, their staff, their wooden poles that each of them carried. And he said, he said, put it in a certain place And in the morning, the man who I have selected, his rod will bud. His rod will uh, um, grow flowers. And so they put all of the rods in there. And the next morning, Aaron's rod had budded. By the way, the text is so cool. I read it yesterday. It's in Numbers chapter 17. You can read it. Not only did Aaron's staff bud, but it put forth buds. It put forth blossoms. And it had ripe almonds as well. So how cool is that? While Aaron was leading the people, he could pick almonds off of his rod and eat his rod. It was a demonstration of what? It was a demonstration of the mighty power of God. And there was a third thing inside the ark, the tables, the tablets of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. You know the story, Moses went up on top of the mountain and God had given him these Ten Commandments written with God's own finger. And as Moses came down from the mountain, the children of Israel were worshiping a golden calf and they were rebelling against God. And Moses took the tablets and he tossed them down and broke them. Well, then the next day or uh, a few days after that, he goes back up to the mountain. He carves out two more tablets. And once again, God writes the Ten Commandments. So there within the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments written with the very finger of God. So the Ark of the Covenant for the Israelites was not only a reminder of God's pardon, but the Ark of the Covenant was a reminder of God's power, of what God had done and what God could do for them. But there was a third reminder, and this is what I want to emphasize today. The Ark of the Covenant thirdly reminded the Israelites of God's presence, that God was with them. If you'll notice in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 25, after, Mo, after God gives Moses the instructions of how the ark should be built and what should be in it, he makes this simple statement in verse 22 that for me is one of the most powerful statements. He says this, there I will meet with Because of their sin, they had ran away from God over and over and over again. And yet God in his grace, God in his mercy gives them a visible reminder that even though because of their sins they might not experience his presence and his power and his forgiveness, he gave them a visible reminder that he was always in their midst. As I've already mentioned, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and the Ark of the Covenant were found in the midst of the Israeli camp. Every single day when the Israelites woke up, when they went to work, when they returned home, they were reminded that God was present with them. Could you imagine waking up walking out of your tent, stretching, and in front of you is the tabernacle with the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant where God was. And you went to work and you walked past the tabernacle which contained the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant where God was. And you came home from work at night and you walked past the tabernacle with the Holy of Holies, with the Ark of the Covenant. God said, it's there, in the Ark, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, I will meet with you. A visual, visible reminder that I am always with you. How cool is that? You might sit back and say, 
Man, Brian, I wish we had one of those. How come we don't have an Ark of the Covenant right down front? And so every Sunday when we come to church, we have this visible reminder of the fact that God is with us. Well, listen, let me just calm you down for a second. We don't want to send out any Raiders of the Lost Ark from Hollywood Community Church. We don't want to send out a group finding the ark so that we can bring it back here and so that we can be reminded of the fact that God is with us. Here's what I want you to catch. This is the message for us today out of Exodus chapter 25. Just because we don't have an ark doesn't mean God is not with us. Oh, catch that. You might sit back and say, oh, man, man, Brian, but if I had an ark... It would be so easy for me to remember in the morning. I get up and with the stress of my, my kids are running around the house and they're yelling and we're trying to get lunches packed and it's easy for me to forget that God is there if there was a visual reminder. If I had an ark in my house, if I had an ark in my community, if I could see it, why? It would help me to remember the fact that God is always with me. I want you to catch this today. You don't need an ark. As a matter of fact, you and I today have a much better reminder than a beautiful ark of the covenant. Here's what I want you to catch. The third point in my outline is this. Although the ark no longer exists, God is still present with his people. You might sit back and say, as I questioned all week, Brian, so what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Where is it? Well, the last time chronologically we find it mentioned in Scripture is 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verses 1 through 6. In, in, In one of the apocryphal books, the book of Maccabees, it mentions something about maybe Jeremiah taking it to a cave during the, the Babylonian conquest and maybe hiding it in a cave. Tradition states, you can Google it, and tradition states that it's located in St. Mary of Zion Church in Axum, Ethiopia. Uh, others say that it's found in a tunnel underneath the, the, uh, the Holy Mount there in Jerusalem. In the Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you're familiar with that movie, it was tracked to the country of Egypt. You say, Brian, what do you think? What do you think? Here's what I think. I think the ark no longer exists. And quite frankly, even if it did exist, it's irrelevant. It's obsolete. It's like a typewriter. How many people own a typewriter? It's like a rotary phone. How many people own a rotary phone? All right. Why don't we own a typewriter? Why don't we own a rotary phone? Because something better has come. And today, you and I don't have the Ark of the Covenant. We don't need the Ark of the Covenant because we have something so much better than the Ark of the Covenant. You say, Brian, what do you mean? How does God demonstrate his presence now? Let me give you three ways. The first is this. The presence of God finds its greatest expression in Emmanuel, God with us. Here's what I'm saying, and it's so much better. So simple. If you catch anything I'm saying today, catch this. This is what the the Bible teaches. This is what you and I need to understand. Jesus reveals God's presence to us. We don't need an Ark of the Covenant. We don't need an ornate box. We don't need something that we can visually see because today you and I have something so much better. We have Jesus. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, made this prophecy, made this promise, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus said in Matthew 28, in verse 20, in his own words, he says, behold, I am with you always. You're a smart group today. What does the word always mean? Always. All the time. The writer of Hebrews fleshes that out just a little bit. Taking the words of Jesus, he says this, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. 
please, please catch this this morning. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are never alone. We used to sing this song. Remember I tell you I used to direct this choir years ago when I first started ministry, and we used to sing this song, No, never alone, no, never alone. Remember that, Vicky? Remember that? He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. That's going to be on the video, by the way, if you want that. <laughs> the greatest expression of the presence of God is Jesus Christ. And as his followers, as his sons and daughters, he is with us all the time. I want you to catch a second thing. But bear with me, the second thing. Although God is omnipresent, he desires to manifest his presence in your life and mine. Let me flesh that out. We believe that God is omnipresent. The word omnipresent means that he is everywhere at one time. He's not limited to time or space. We could sit back and say God is with us today. That does not mean that he's not at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. It doesn't mean that he's not at Taft Street Baptist Church. It doesn't mean that he's not at Iglesia Reforma where my son Justin is preaching this morning. It doesn't mean that he's not with Cedar Creek Community Church where Mark is preaching this morning. He's with my kids. He's with your kids because he is omnipresent. He is everywhere concurrently. He he is everywhere at the exact same time. He is not limited by time or space. He is omnipresent. But catch this. It's easy for us to sit back and say, ho-hum, God is omnipresent. I know he's here. I know he's there. I know he's everywhere. But here's what God wants. God wants to manifest his presence in your life and mine in a powerful way. And we sit back at times and we boringly, if we're not careful, admit that God is everywhere, but we don't sense his power. We don't sense his presence. We don't sense his conviction in our lives. Our lives are not the same. And that's not what God wants for your life and mine. God not only wants to understand his omnipresence, but God wants to manifest himself, his presence in your life and mine in a powerful way. You see, there is a difference between saying God is everywhere and saying God is here right now. Catch the head. There is a difference between saying God is everywhere and God is here. Do we believe God is everywhere? Absolutely we believe God is everywhere. But most importantly for me and you today, I believe with all of my heart that God is here right now. He is in our midst this morning. And God desires to speak to you just as Brian is speaking to you. And God desires for you to hear his voice just as you are hearing my voice this morning. Yes, he's here. Yes, he's in Africa. Yes, he's in Guatemala. Yes, he's with your kids and with mine. But he's here today. Do you sense his presence? Are your ears open to hearing what he has to say. Why do you think throughout scripture it says, he or she who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because if we're not careful, we do to God what I frequently do to my wife. I hear, but I don't listen. I'm in the room, God speaking, but I'm listening to the television I'm distracted by the things of life. And though God is speaking to me, I'm, obli I'm oblivious to what God is doing. God desires to manifest his presence in your life and in mine every single day. And he desires to do that in a palpable and in a powerful way. You say, Brian, how do we experience that? He wants us to recognize him. He wants us to relate to him. He wants us to rely on him. And he wants us to respond to him. Let 
let me give you a, a simple illustration, then we'll look at a passage of scripture, and we'll be done. We were missionaries in Mexico for 10 years, and uh, our first year was spent in a, in a town called Querétaro, where we, where we learned, they taught us how to speak Spanish, all right? I mean, they taught us how to roll the R's, they taught us how to do all of that. We learned vocabulary, we learned all of those stuff, but not only did they teach us the language, they taught us the culture. So one of the things that our teacher, Georgia Webb, taught us is that when you enter in a, in a room to be culturally correct, you speak to every single person. And so you just don't walk in a room. We have a tendency in our culture to walk in and say, hey, y'all, you know, and, and go grab something to drink or something. But, but, but in Mexico, they taught us, no, you, you enter in and you take the time and you speak with every person. Hey, Sharon, how are you? Hey, Mike, how are you? Hey, Vicky, how are you? You speak to every single person. And then when you leave, guess what you got to do? You got to say goodbye to, to every single person. And so, I mean, we used to we used to plan it. Okay, Vicky, we want to leave at nine, so we probably had to start saying goodbye about eight thirty. All right, because we needed to say goodbye to everyone. Then you would sit back and say, "That's crazy. Why would you do that?" Because in that culture, if you didn't speak to someone, you didn't recognize their presence. It was as if that person did not exist. So, follow my train of thought this morning. How often do we wake up in our lives and God is with us, but we don't speak to him. We don't recognize his presence. He's there. We're just too busy to recognize him. And so here's God. I wake up in the morning and and he's sitting at the table with me as I'm drinking my coffee, just waiting for me to speak to him, just waiting for me to tell him what I need that day, just waiting to admit to him my my weaknesses and my failures so that he can help me. He's there. But whether it's busyness, whether it's self-dependence, whether it's pride, I act as if I don't need him. And I go through the day and I don't recognize his presence in our life. One of, one of our pastors in Mexico was a little guy named Alcideberto Garcia. We called him Beto. Uh, in Mexico, I love how they pray. They always pray, pray with these beautiful prayers. They start out, Bendito Padre, Glorioso y, y, y Celestial, and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, que están los cielos and everything. Beto didn't pray that way. When Beto started praying, Beto started, he, he, started, he, started pray, he prayed like this. Buenos dias, Señor. In the beginning, I thought, I got to teach this guy how to pray, man. He, just, he doesn't pray like everybody else prays. And then I realized, Beto gets it. He gets it because he begins the day, good morning, Lord. Good morning. I need you in my life. You see, that's what God desires for us. God is present with us, but we fail to recognize his presence. Let me give you a last thing. As believers, we are invited to enter into his presence. Hebrews chapter 4, Jason read these verses just a little bit ago. Let me read them again. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted like we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Why? so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So as we look at the Ark of the Covenant today, we can study its measurements and we can study its specifications and we can study its beauty and and we can study its history and we can wonder where it is, does it exist? But here's the simple message for you and me today. Just as God met with the Israelites, he desires to meet Daily victory is available in your life and in mine whenever you recognize, whenever you respond to the presence of God in your life. You say, Brian, why am I struggling? Because you're trying to do it on your own. You might have the greatest intentions in the world. 
but you're trying to do it on your own. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. And here's the good news. He's here. He's here. And he desires to powerfully work in your life. Would you reach out to him? Would you allow him? Would you seek that relationship with him? He said, if you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. I'm not hiding from you. I want to have a relationship with you. Seek me and allow me to work in your life.